Alright, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you happen to be. My name is Christopher Harrison. This is Web Wednesday, the show where we bring on some really cool people to talk about all things web dev. Uh, now, today I'm really pleased to be bringing uh, Aaron Powell back on to chat about TypeScript and about GraphQL. Now, TypeScript and GraphQL are topics that we've uh, done in the past in sort of um, other places. Uh, Aaron was actually on to chat a bit about TypeScript script and react which is a fantastic um, uh, coupling of, uh, of those two things and then we also had Jeremy Lickness on to talk about how you could create a blazer app with GraphQL so now we're going to take a look at it from the TypeScript side so that way if maybe you're doing JavaScript and still not a hundred percent certain about why it is that you uh, should be using TypeScript hopefully this will really help provide uh, a little bit of information there but also just take a look at how these two technologies can come together. But enough of me babbling. Let's go ahead and uh, and bring Aaron on. So Aaron, thanks again for uh, for joining. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. I, I, I see the sunlight and the fan there. For anybody who doesn't know, Aaron is in Australia. So apparently it's like it's summer down there. I'm in Seattle and it is decidedly neither sunny nor warm. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's overcast today but it's an, a pleasant temperature i don't have air conditioning in my room which is why i have this little pedestal fan over the, the back there and the doors closed so otherwise it would become a sweat box and you would see uh, <laughs> you would see me you know, just dripping with sweat by the end of this episode <laughs> Yeah, I can I, I, I can understand that. It does actually get pretty hot periodically here, um, especially uh, especially of late. But uh, uh, but yeah. Um, so I, you know, normally I would start with like you know how you got into like tech and how you became Aaron Powell. But we've you know like done that a fair bit in in the past. So let me just start kind of real quick uh, before we get into the rest of it. It's like what have you been working on lately that uh, that you're kind of excited about? Yeah, uh, so I mean, GraphQL has been really quite dominant for me for the last sort of oh, okay. eighteen months to nearly two years. Um, in terms of looking at the applications that we've got for it and, and how we can use that, um, I, throughout the end of last year, I was actually looking at GraphQL from like the headless CMS space. So projects like Strapi and Keystone JS and things like that are, are, are ways to, to be, kind of build GraphQL servers, but without having to kind of go to the details of so what we'll do today where we're like building everything from scratch and and provide that sort of stuff into the um like a website that you're building or a mobile application or where, whatever it may be um, okay yeah i've been doing a lot of stuff on on uh, on graphql still uh, and of course react because i'd be i'd be remiss if i didn't uh, have a little bit of react in my life <laughs> I, I, I can appreciate that. Although I've I found myself these days really gravitating a lot more towards Svelte um, over uh, over React, but you know, just a matter of personal preference there. Yeah, I've I've it's been on my backlog for so long. I feel like it's just one of those. I, it's, it's that to do list backlog that everyone has, and you're like, oh, I'll totally <laughs> totally get to that. Won't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I certainly I certainly feel that. Um, so let's um, I, I do want to define a term because I, I really do like try to take that Scott Hanselman approach of like, let's always make sure that we're defining our our TLAs. And for anybody who's not familiar, a TLA is a three letter abbreviation or a three letter acronym. Um, you mentioned CMS earlier. What is a CMS? Oh, Just uh, so, define uh, the term real yeah. quick. Yeah, no, it's a good point. Um, and I, I try to be better at that myself. But so a CMS is a content management system. So if you think about you know, uh, a website, like whether it's a, like a brochureware website or an e-com platform or um, like any website where you've got text, you need some way to get that text to people. If you've got a dynamic website, you probably want some way that you can do that fairly dynamically and you don't want to be relying on developers to constantly have to go in there and, oh, we need to um, update this product name or we want to change the description of a, of a person on our website. You don't want a developer to have to do that every single time. So this is where a content management system will come in. You have some kind of editor-friendly UI that they can, um, a, a non-technical or a less technical person could come in, um, edit that, and then make that available to the consuming systems downstream. Okay, perfect. And then the other term that you mentioned, and I think this is a perfect segue then into our, our conversation, is you obviously, of course, mentioned GraphQL. Uh, now, we do have other videos on, on GraphQL, and I'm going to go dig up the, the link here um, in, uh, in a couple of minutes, so that way I can post that into, into chat. But what is, what is GraphQL? Yeah, well, so 
maybe rather than kind of hand waving descriptions, um, can we jump to the slides that I've got? Um, yeah. And let's just use some diagrams to kind of talk through this and, and, and a bit of a con conceptual model. So fundamentally, GraphQL is a way to communicate and get data out of um, our backend systems. So let's say that we're building a, a quiz application. So I, I, I started um, building this prototype and this demo application that we're gonna uh, have a look at shortly throughout lockdowns and when the only way that we could <laughs> with our friends was through like some form of video conferencing platform where we were playing uh, quiz games. A quiz game, like how hard could it be? Um, but, so, so we're gonna have to model a bunch of different data for that. So um, let's start off with a quiz. We're gonna have some way to identify that quiz. That's gonna have some players. We might have state, like is the game waiting for players to join? Are they, is the game in progress or has the game been completed? And then we've got questions and answers. So then this becomes, uh, we might have like a relational data model on this. So we have our player and relationship to that. So we can go from the quiz, we can get back to the player, um, but a player also has a relationship to the games or the, the quizzes that they've been involved in. Then we've got questions that are um, that are there. They're, they're attached again to our quiz, and they've got a series of answers that could be presented because it's multiple choice. Um, one of those is going to be listed as the correct answer. So this is just a like this is a data model that we're working with. Now, commonly we would expose this as REST. Like this is the way that I traditionally built applications was building REST-based um, APIs, and that's what I like. A, a lot of the audience might be familiar with doing REST, and that we tend to expose as a couple of endpoints. So we might have a quiz endpoint where you can get back all the quizzes. Maybe that's an admin feature. We get back a quiz by its ID. And we get back players by their ID or questions and a question by their ID. So it's it's very much um, structured around the data model itself. It seems very restrictive. Like I can do this, but I can't do something else. Yes, exactly. And, and that's kind of where GraphQL comes in. So GraphQL, um, and I... Uh, a 30 second history lesson for people that are very new to GraphQL or haven't been following it um, uh, prior to today. GraphQL was actually created by Facebook to solve problems that they had with the way that they were doing uh, uh, data-centric APIs. Now, uh, since then, um, it's been handed over to an open source foundation called the GraphQL Foundation. They are actually in control of GraphQL as a language. So GraphQL is really just, a, it's, a, it's a language of how to communicate between a client and a server. And where you're correct there to say REST could be a little bit restrictive because the server is very much in control of the way the data is exposed. In a GraphQL system, a client is the ones in, uh, in control of how the data that they want to get is, of, uh, what data that they want to get. So a server is still going to say, like, here's the things you can get. You can't just magic up data out of a GraphQL <laughs> server. But the client can say, well, I want to get back, well, um, and, and this is a GraphQL query, and I guess to, to kind of illustrate that, um, it's a, the server says, well, you hear back games um, by their ID or all of the games or player results. Um, and then from this, we can then follow through our data model. So I can say from a game, I want a game by its ID, but I only care about the players that are there and their names and maybe the, the game ID itself. So instead of also, instead of from a REST standpoint, we'd have to, hit the like the, the game endpoint we pass it the id we would then get back that we would then get back a series of player ids we would then hit the player's endpoint and we pass through each of those ids and we could be requesting like it could you know, there's a an n number of requests that could happen here because we don't know how many players there are and all just to get back a list of names of who is actually playing our quiz game okay so that's where graphql i guess is, is different and it gives a lot more control to that client because instead of having the the server saying, no, you have to you know, make multiple requests to get the data. The client says, this is the request I want and the data I want back from that request. You kind of figure out how it happens. Now, I, and, and I might be putting you on the, on the spot here. And if, if I am, you can totally pass on, on, on the question. Um, but, but, but I do want to ask it is, I know that there is another protocol that's there called OData or Open Data API, I think is, is what it stands for, yeah. um, which does something very similar to this, where it allows the client to craft a query. Um, and if I remember right, like craft something that looks very much like SQL and be able to, to send that over. How does GraphQL differ from, from OData? Uh, so you're, you're right that there is definitely some analogies that can be drawn between the two of them. Okay. Because probably the primary difference is that um, GraphQL is designed to be more of an abstraction over the concept of how you can access data 
um, and it's not prescriptive about what that backend system is going to be doing and how you get it. Um, I, so you don't really have a, I guess, a query language in the same way as you get out of OData. OData is much more around, um, you're hitting an endpoint that you provide a very structured query to it, and then you're expecting your endpoint to potentially translate that query into um, uh, like the, the underlying query language. Like you, it is SQL-like, but maybe you're not executing SQL directly. Um, right. But at the, at the end of the day, the um, it is still putting more power in the control of the client, but the the semantics of the way the server works with those are a little bit different. At least that's my understanding of it. Um, there's, uh, I'm I'm sure there are lots of um, better <laughs> articles out there that will do the do the service of explaining the differences between OData and, and GraphQL. Um, and I have been uh, I've been known to make. Um, uh, quips that you, you know, GraphQL is really just OData for JavaScript hipsters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that's kind of all right. <laughs> it's sort of downplaying the significance that GraphQL uh, has. Okay. All right. I dig it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so I guess I, I hopefully that can um, can give people an idea of the sorts of things that we're going to be looking at. Uh, in this, when we when we jump over to code and and um, and start building out an application, and yeah, see where GraphQL um, can be powerful in this space. Now, I I, I do want to um, highlight real quick here is um, you know when I'm when I'm looking at this, I'm immediately thinking this is a perfect use case for for TypeScript because um, you know for anybody who doesn't know, the great thing about TypeScript is I can define um, interfaces or I can define types. And by the way, those are weightless, so they're actually like removed when it's converted into into JavaScript. And so now I can get a lot of that uh, IntelliSense and a lot of that autocomplete and kind of be able to structure and know what my objects look like um, when they're when they're coming down. And it it feels like like, you know, with, with GraphQL, I could be sort of like flying without a, a safety net, um, if, if you will. But now with TypeScript, I can now get that that safety net. That type safety pun was not intended, but we're, we're just going to go with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, no, and, and this is, yeah, I, I very much agree with you on that idea that um, TypeScript does lend itself quite nicely. Because if you, you're looking at this, and obviously this is a very subset of a larger GraphQL schema. And we write a schema in GraphQL that represents what the server is capable of exposing to a client. And you can see that that top bit here is we have the, the type keyword and then query. And then like there's obviously something here, like we've, we've got some data models that I've obviously custom created, like uh, um, game here. And there, there's um, syntax that, uh, so the, the exclamation point or the bang operator here is indicating that something cannot be null. We've got mm -hmm. square parentheses, which are, uh, as a developer, I just immediately know that's going to represent an array or a sequence or something to that degree. Um, and so we, we can see that there, there's probably something here that is implying a type system from a GraphQL schema. So being able to pull that across to TypeScript, I think makes just like a good bit of natural sense. I, I, I would agree. Um, before we get into the demo, there's one real quick question that came up, um, which I think is, is, is good to ask. So over on Twitch, uh, Sean 2416 asks, when should we not use GraphQL? Yeah, and, and that's a great question. So there's definitely been a huge trend, uh, particularly in the JavaScript space of going towards GraphQL, but the thing that to be, uh, I guess, to be mindful of is is GraphQL you know, the same as REST and the same as OData and the same as custom built APIs? There are going to be use cases that it's right for and use cases that it is not right for. It um, it was originally created by Facebook, as I said before, uh, and not everyone has Facebook style problems. So, <laughs> a solution that was designed for a Facebook style problem doesn't necessarily match for everyone. Um, scenarios where it's not going to be ideal, at least, and again, part of this is going to be my opinion, so take that with a grain of salt, uh, is that GraphQL is quite difficult to create a really um, secured API because it can be so exploratory. Um, so in the case of this query that I've got on the bottom on the screen at the moment, we're starting with a game object, which then has a, um, a relationship to a player's object, uh, and that might have a relationship to something else. Well. How do we ensure that um, the the an authenticated user has access to only the data they're allowed to see? Like they can't see the email 
address of a player that's not themselves. So this is kind of like row level security you're almost thinking about oh. inside of a database. But the client doesn't know that it has that level of security. So how do you make sure that you're enforcing that? And this can be something that is quite difficult to do with GraphQL. The, the language itself is not necessarily designed to do that um, in the way that you might expect it if you're coming from REST or from building custom APIs. So that's where it might not be the right solution for you uh, and the kind of applications that you build. Um, the other is if you're working with something that has um, highly nested data, because I can, I guess to, to use a another kind of a program analogy i can dot through objects so i could start from um, and we'll actually see this in the schema that we're going to build um, from the game i can go to players which can then go back to games which can go to players which can go to games which can go to players which can go to games <laughs> so you can see the recursion that's happening um how do how do you stop someone from essentially ddosing your own so creating a denial of service attack on your own infrastructure because they've created a query that's a recursive query right um, right yeah so it's, it's something to be careful of with your um with your um designs it's not to say that any of these are like deal breakers they're just things that um, make it potentially the wrong solution for a problem that you might have okay that makes that makes a lot of sense that makes a lot of sense yeah so ho hopefully um sean 2416 that has uh helped answer the question for you I, 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 it answered it for me. So <laughs> that's good enough. <laughs> we'll go with that. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, I've, we've, we've been on for 15 minutes. Maybe, maybe yeah. it's about time we do get across to some code. I, I, I agree completely. All right. So I'm going to jump to, um, uh, before I jump to code, uh, I'll just jump to the browser. Uh, so for the code that I'm going to be showing, it's uh, we're going to jump through various sections of a workshop that I've created around doing GraphQL with TypeScript. Um, you'll find that uh, link on my GitHub, github.com slash Aaron Powell slash GraphQL TypeScript workshop. Um, and I think Christopher is frantically typing that into chat to <laughs> send it. Uh, to, to As a matter of fact. Um, <laughs> Um, but if uh, so, if you want to follow along or you want to um, do this yourself, uh, feel free to, to clone this repository um, and yeah, and jump through it uh, and and play around with the code yourself. But without further ado, let's jump over here to VS Code um, and uh, we're going to start at the very start. So this is the um, the first step of our workshop, uh, and we I, I've kind of dealt with some of the boilerplate of this so it's got a scaffolded out react application it's got a scaffolded out um, api application where we're going to be building our graphql server uh, and that's using azure functions um, i'm going to be uh, i've also set up uh, a dev container for this so that will pre-install the azure function runtime and all those sorts of things it'll um, set up all the tooling and um, VS Code extensions that you might want. Uh, so that, for me, that's the quickest way to get up and running. Like, I, I love dev containers. I could probably do like an entire hour just talking about <laughs> how cool they are and why every project should have them. Uh, but you're not here to learn about dev containers. You're here to learn about GraphQL and such. <laughs> we actually um, had Burke a few weeks ago to talk about dev oh, containers. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. It was a go, lot of fun. Go, uh, yeah, go, go, go watch that, um, that episode instead. Yeah. Um, because... Uh, there's nothing worse than watching someone fat finger things while they're trying to type out uh, commands in uh, a terminal or in VS Code or anything like that. I'm going to cheat and just use the uh, the, the instructions out of the readme. Uh, but the first thing I've done is I've gone to the API folder and then we're going to install some uh, uh, node packages. So I'm going to be installing the Apollo server Azure Functions uh, by, uh, um, library and I'm going to install GraphQL. So let's just kick that off. Um, and I'll talk a bit about what those are while they're installing. So Apollo Server is an implementation of a GraphQL server and they've got bindings for all sorts of different um, hosting platforms. In this case, I'm using Azure Functions just because I kind of like the, um, the programmatic model of Azure Functions. But if you wanted to host it in say uh, an Express application or Koa or like any other serverless platforms, like they've got bindings to do all that. So. Um, like I said, I've gone Azure Functions just because it was simple and super easy for the workshop that I wanted to do here. But the stuff that I'm covering is not going to be Azure Functions specific um, after we kind of set up the Azure Functions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. All right. 
So they're, they're, they're all installed. Uh, and now let's create a Azure function. So yeah, I, I said, let's, let's not do anything that's Azure function specific. And then I go and create an Azure function. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, for anybody who's never- out of myself. Yeah. <laughs> and for anybody who's not familiar, uh, npx um, is a command that will actually allow you to run something from uh, from a package, run like a command line from a package without actually having to install that package. Yeah, and what this is doing is it's using the Azure Functions command line tool to create a new HTTP trigger template uh, and calling that GraphQL. And I think that's running, or is that there? Yeah, okay, there we go. <laughs> that's done. Took just and long like enough to make you nervous. <laughs> Exactly, yeah. Well, because I because I've run through this so many times, like I I know where things should take. Oh, whoops, where have I gone? I've gone to wrong screen. There we go. Um, I know where things should take a while and where they shouldn't, and that shouldn't have taken the time that it did. But all good. <laughs> um, here we go. We have it in our editor. Here we have our GraphQL Azure function um, defined. We have the index.ts and the function JSON. Now, the only thing that I have to do custom for Apollo and Azure Functions is I need to change the way the output bindings of Azure Functions works. So um, this template, when I scaffold it up, it will uh, want to output to a variable named res. Uh, because Apollo doesn't know that it's going to be called res or response or the thing I want to send to my client, um, it expects it to be a return value from the Azure Function. So Azure Function either return a value or it can be um, as an output uh, uh, in a variable. Um, so I've, I've just got to change that there. So that's what it, the dollars return represents. Um, and now we can close that file off. Uh, cool. Now I'm going to jump over to, <laughs> sorry, one, one second. My, my wife is standing at the door looking at me like she wants to ask a question. Uh, so <laughs> this, is, like, this is the fun of live streaming, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's on uh, my uh, bedside table, I think. Sorry, my, my wife is just looking for our transport card for my six-year-old so we can go into the city. <laughs> uh, cool. This is, yeah, this, this is fun. Okay, we'll, we'll move along and pretend that we're professionals here. <laughs> Last week, um, one of the uh, one of our guests had their cat jump up onto their monitor just as she started her demo. So this is just you know this is this is the life we live now. Exactly. Um, so I'm just going to come down and uh, grab some code. Whoops, where am I? Sorry, I'm scrolling around like a mad person. Uh, here we go. So let's just start building out our GraphQL implementation, uh, GraphQL application. It's going to be super simple. I'm going to delete everything here. I'm going to import Apollo Server and um, the GQL. So GQL is a template literal that allows me to create the um, GraphQL. Um, uh, schema so i've created a super simple schema here it has a type called query and that is going to have a uh a thing exposed in that query called hello and, then and that's not a, a typescript type that you're creating just to to confirm correct correct so this is a graphql schema type okay uh not a um not typescript or anything like that so uh i've got some syntax highlighting here and i think she can't find the Can open I don't think it's in my wallet. I think it was just there. But here's my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> she actually caught that. Like I just, I just threw it uh, towards the door, and she caught it. I was like, "Kudos <laughs> to my wife." Um, you can't see that on uh, off camera, but yeah, it was a, it was a good catch and, and a good throw by me as well. Um, sorry, I've got I've got a, an extension. Um, the, so the dev container will actually install the extension for GraphQL. Um, uh, it will be uh, give that syntax highlighting here inside of the GQL template literal. Oh, okay. Uh, I've then created a resolver. So the resolvers are the things that are going to handle what the GraphQL schema can do. Um, so that is, um, so that's why it actually matches the same structure. So you see it's got query here, query, hello. And then this is the function that will be executed when we hit that. And then we have our server um, using the Apollo server. I give it our schema, our type definitions and our resolvers. It's going to smash them together. Uh, and then I expose the uh, an, an Azure function that we can use. So that looks go. very similar to just like spinning up, say, uh, an Express server or a Restify server. Exactly. Yeah. So it's um, like there's there's not really any kind of Azure function semantics that you care about. Kind of once you get into 
um, are actually building it. So, so now that like we've set up the basic Azure function, we've told it how it's going to um, return the value to the client. It should be all good from here. Okay. Now, let's just see. Okay, so this is just uh, so this is written in TypeScript. So it's just compiling that down. Um, it should be up and running and. Uh, it looks like that we have had an error. Yay! <laughs> I've got a incompatible version of Node. Uh, that's an easy fix. NVM install 14. Because I, of, of course, have uh, updated to Node latest inside of this dev container. And then we do <laughs> NPM, uh, NVM use 14. And we'll do NPM start. So and we're really cooking here. Yeah, yes. Hopefully, Everything. Uh, but hopefully this doesn't explode a second time. <laughs> Excellent. There we go. Our server is up and running. Let's pop this into our browser and we'll zoom in. So um, uh, Apollo has a, uh, a sandbox playground where you can uh, test out queries. So let's go over and do that. And fingers crossed that uh, I'm gonna have to zoom this one in as well. There we go. Okay, so it has, um, so it, up here, it's just got the uh, HTTP endpoint that we're uh, hitting with our GraphQL server. And we can see that it's it's picked up out what our um, schema looks like. So we have this um, root type, which is called query. It has a field called hello. And if I hit test query, we get hello from our GraphQL backend. Mm. Woohoo! We have made our first GraphQL server. Um, it's returning from our actual functions. I could, if I wanted, uh, set a breakpoint with inside of here. Oh, I'd have to breakpoint inside of there. Never mind. I won't. <laughs> but you kind of get the idea. Like, you, yeah. You, you can see that we, we've proved the concept. We've built mm -hmm. a GraphQL server. So let's kill this and let's jump forward in time a little bit with inside of our workshop and have a look at another step. So um, just kind of for the um, sakeness of time, uh, not going to go through all, uh, all eight steps um, in real time. Uh, you can do those yourselves uh, afterwards if you want. Uh, instead, we're gonna jump through to uh, step number four where uh, in here, I've actually gone and built a bit more of our Azure function. So I've, what I've done here is I've extracted out the schema into its own file. Sorry, this is the file I actually wanted, not the index.ts. Uh, and this is a, a much more rich, complex schema. And you know, to the, the point that you made um, earlier on, Christopher, is that you'll see that we have what kind of looks like a type system. And it, it kind of, it's, it's a little type script desk, isn't it? Yeah. You know, we've got a, a, a type question. This kind of looks like a type in TypeScript. Like we don't have equal symbols and things like that, but we've got, you know, we've got scalar types, we've got strings, we've got arrays. I come down to the game, we can see there's array of players, which is refer representing uh, referencing this type down here. We've even got enums and stuff like that. If I come right down to the bottom, here's what we had with inside of our slide deck. So there's those, um, those types that are exposed by our query. And then um, a schema, which just says, well, here's kind of your entry point. This is how you're going to work with our, uh, our uh, underlying systems. Okay, I, so, I, I, I dig that, all right. Yeah, um, so I, I've also refactored our um, Azure function kind of entry point a little bit. Um, so we now, instead of having that GQL um, and that schema kind of embedded in the TypeScript file itself, um, I'm loading that from this external file. So we'll see that that's just loading it by walking some directories and things like that. Um, and then we're gonna add some resolvers to it. And I've, um, uh, the other thing that I've also done is I've created a, a data structure that represents how we would store the data for this, um, uh, for, for our backend system. Um, uh, the, the workshop has an in-memory data store, or it can be connected up to Cosmos DB, like if you want persistence. Uh, at the moment, we're gonna, just going to be using in-memory, uh, just so I don't have to worry about setting up Cosmos DB and things like that. Um, the in-memory one also has uh, some... Um, uh, static data and stuff that it, it scaffolds up. So you end up with some basic questions and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and actually handle what our new schema kind of looks like because I put out this resolvers file here and well, we can see it's got kind of nothing in it. So what is a resolver? 
so a resolver is going to be handling what our schema says that it can do so we need at the moment it has um i get a game by its id i can get back games or i can get back player results okay well, how do we do that like how does it know to translate this to say a like a cosmos query to get back a game by id or you know to walk through an in-memory model um I actually let, just before i start let's just check the node version <laughs> and it's a 16. uh we'll do mdm install 14. um i think I, I could probably down level the 16 a little bit i can't remember to like what version of 16 is supported by the the node um tools uh, so the the azure function tools but we'll just use 14 because i know that's safe oops mvm u mv mvm use 14 and npm i just wanted to start the server in the background uh, because it will take a few seconds to get running while we go ahead and try and build something so okay let's um let's just pop this to the right uh split editor to the right close that and then let's let, let's handle what that query can do because at the moment like the the server will start it will but if we try and hit any of these endpoints it'll kind of just explode because it doesn't know what to do so let's start with games we need to like how do we handle games um so i'm going to need to well i, I know that i need to make a function here and this is going to be a function that returns something but well what arguments does it take? I don't, I don't know. And I don't have any type safety. And you, you, I guess you can kind of see where the breakdown is starting to happen with our type safety. We're starting to lose some of that value because I don't have any type information here. Right. Now, because I've worked with Apollo, I know that there are some arguments that come into this resolver. The first is going to be the parent of this resolver in the resolver chain because um, resolvers uh, can be nested. So um, like from a game, if I want to get players, how does it kind of follow that hierarchy? That'll make a bit more sense later on when we um, fill this resolver um, implementation out a bit more. But there's a parent. I know I don't need it, so I can just kind of ignore it. The second argument is arguments that are passed to this resolver. Now, games doesn't have any arguments, but game does. So I can just ignore that. Um, and then, well, I need some way to access my data stores. Well, I've set this up so that it is injected via the context of the resolver. So I know that I can do data sources here. Sources, because, well, I wrote the code, so I, I, I know what <laughs> comes next. Um, so I, I know that that all works. And I know that I can do return data sources dot gain dot, oh, is it games? I, I don't know. But you notice that I don't have any IntelliSense here. I don't, I'm not getting any type safety. Um, but I think it's get game. Like, I think that that works. Only one way to find out. out. Exactly. And then I know that I, oh, so I, I need to implement game and then I can ignore the first argument. I know that I have an ID that comes in here. And then I know that I'm going to get data sources. And then I can return data sources dot game dot get game by ID. At least I think that's what it's called. So. But, but we don't know, and, and we've really lost any value that TypeScript is kind of giving us here. Right. Cool. Yeah. Our server is up and running. Uh, but yeah, so, so let's, let's see if it did work. So we'll come back to here. Uh, we'll restart, uh, reload our sandbox. Um, we'll see, it's still got the old query here, but it's telling us that hello doesn't exist anymore, so we can delete that. Uh, we'll come back up to query. And it seemingly hasn't picked up what our query should be, which is somewhat annoying. So let's come back into here. Let's just reopen this one in the browser. Now, oh, of course, it's on a different port. For yeah. Some <laughs> uh, API GraphQL. Oh, no, not 3000. What was it? 7072. 7072. Query our server, come back over. Okay, cool. So we found all that the looks things better. there. Yeah, that looks a lot better. Let's get back all of the games. And we can see as I can kind of navigate through this. And let's say I want, I want to get game by the ID and the state. And maybe I want like players and I want the player names. Mm. Well, let's hit query. Um, oh, I don't actually have any data. So, well, seemingly I got all my API calls correct. 
So it did actually return something, but I like because I didn't have any data in there. It's just returned no values. But just for I'm going to say sheer dumb luck, I managed to type all of this correctly. Well done. <laughs> yeah, but I I, I hope that um, uh, like those of you that are watching and and Christopher yourself, you can kind of see that. Well, we've we've lost kind of value here. I, I I know what these things are, but I've got just like there's any's all over the place. And at this point, we may as well not be using TypeScript. I may as well just be using plain old JavaScript to write this because TypeScript has ceased to give me value. Yeah, I I think that's like like just a good general rule. Like there's there there absolutely is a time and place in TypeScript to be using the any data type, but but to like quote Martin Fowler from um uh you know his his uh, famous refactoring book, you know code smells that if you're doing that, it's a smell like it's 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 an indication that you're probably not doing the right thing. So if you're using any in TypeScript, you're probably not using doing the right thing. Yeah, exactly. So we'll just go, let's go through the process of uh, install node 14. While and, you're uh, doing that, Sean, um, uh, 2416 um, uh, had another question, which is, can GraphQL queries be cached by browsers? And I guess my sub question to that would be, could you then use GraphQL to sub query the data that was returned? Um, so the, uh, the answer, I mean, yes, I, because any anything that is a HTTP endpoint could theoretically be cached by a browser. Um, more likely, you're going to be using a GraphQL client side library that will have a form of caching built into it. Um, this might not be maybe persistent across sessions, um, but if someone is like with inside of a, a single page application and they're navigating around that, um, the the requery might be cached just locally on their machine for that session. Um, Additionally, on a server, you would potentially be using a cache of some form to optimize for particular styles of queries and particular um, query results. Uh, there is a, a, a startup that launched last year called GraphCDN, which is a GraphQL CDN designed for doing this sort of stuff. So like you kind of sit that in front of a GraphQL server to do caching, um, so you don't kind of have to build it yourself. Um, yeah. Okay. I appreciate that. Um, and Hiroja, it sort of like leads us in perfectly. It's like, is there an appropriate type which we can add to the resolve a variable to get some support? Which is, yes. <laughs> as so a matter of fact. You've, you've, you've read my mind. Uh, so I've, I've jumped forward again uh, to, well, let's look at how we can leverage type generation. So there's kind of two schools of thought when it comes to type generation. and. I'm just going to jump through my slide deck uh, to uh, control G. No, I'm going to jump through to a slide. And I can't remember what the shortcut in PowerPoint is to jump forward in slides. Um, but I did actually have a section on generating types. So there's two ways you can go about it. Um, there is a schema first model. And so schema first is, well, we have a type system that's represented with inside of our GraphQL schema. They kind of look like our JavaScript primitives or like our TypeScript type definitions. I mean, they're not exactly the same, but they have some clear, I guess, um, influence on the way like a, a, that kind of a type system works. And a schema first approach allows you to have a really clear separation between the types that are in your schema and the application that you're building. So you don't end up with it uh, um, being overly bound to each other. Um, I like to use a tool called GraphQL Code Generator to go ahead and do this generation. And we'll see this uh, in action in a little bit. Um, alternatively, there is a code first approach that you can do this. Uh, this, is, uh, this is really popular in strongly typed languages such as C Sharp um, uh, and uh, the, the libraries that support GraphQL and C Sharp, but you can still do it with TypeScript. Um, so we create our TypeScript um, type objects, so our classes and things like that. And then we um, extract the type definitions from those to then generate our schema. So we're using our TypeScript types to build our schema rather than our schema to build our TypeScript types. So it's that's you know, code first versus schema first. So this gives a really clear relationship between the way our types are defined and the resolvers that are there. Um, oops, my audio just went silent. I don't know if that's for any particular reason. No, you're still good. Yeah, I, I had muted my Mac for a second. Ah, okay, cool. <laughs> I was like, wait, did my browser just die? I, I'm not sure. Um, 
So, but if you're looking to go uh, the type first route, um, type graphql.com um, has uh, it's a good strong open source project to do this sort of stuff. Um, it uses um, decorators in TypeScript to uh, do that sort mm. of stuff. Um, and yeah, so you again pick whichever model works best for you. I prefer schema first, and that's the route that we're going to go when I go back to the code over here. Um, so, so this is um. This is GraphQL Code Generator, and I'll bump that a touch more. Uh, and this is just on their website. They've got a, a little sample here. And uh, where's my scrolly? Where's my scrolly thing? Here we go. So we have a simple little schema that they've defined. It's got some types in here. It's got some enums. It's even got interfaces and unions. So other things that I'm not touching on inside of this demo today, but uh, more advanced features of uh, of GraphQL's query language. And what we can do with this is we can generate um, a uh, using uh, their generation tool a bunch of TypeScript types. That's here on the right hand side. Now, if we have a look at that, it, it kind of it, you can see where the similarities are. So let's go back to the, the top here, and we have our query type, which has me, user, etc. We'll see there's me, and we've got user, which is optional as a result that we can see there because uh, and denoted by our question mark. Our operator. Uh, we've got an enum that's down here. We have um, a union type as well. And, and uh, okay, this actually it looks very much like a kind of thing that we'd be doing for GraphQL. Uh, sorry, for for TypeScript if we were writing this ourselves. So let's go ahead and add that into our project. So again, for cheat's sake, I'm going to copy and paste from my notes. <laughs> We're going to install the GraphQL Code Gen CLI uh, as a dev dependency of the API project. And then we will use the GraphQL Code Gen um, init uh, uh, command um, using MPX to just execute that out of the local package. Uh, give this okay, a minute to uh, install the myriad of node modules that we will be needing here. Is the um, is that browser? So if I have like uh, my my GraphQL query written, can I just copy and paste that into that browser window, and then it will just generate the the TypeScript for me right there? Yeah, for sure. Actually, we can oh. have a look at, while we install our node packages. We can actually do that. Yeah. So we just po paste that in here. Look at uh, that. So look at that. Yeah, super fast. Uh, and it, so GraphQL code gen is it's not just for TypeScript. It actually will do a bunch of um, other languages. So we can do like we can generate C sharp, Java, Flow, um, JS. Talk. You can get it to just give you like a um, an AST. So you could do that for your own custom ones. Um, we can. Uh, uh, this is a tool we'll also use for integrating into um, into React a little bit later, uh, if we've got time. Otherwise, we'll look at a completed version of how we can do that. Uh, but yeah, it's a lot of like it's really powerful in what it can can uh, give us. That is really cool. We've got about 15 minutes, so we still, we still have a yep. fair bit of time. We've still got time. Okay, so let's um, let's initialize our uh, our schema, uh, sorry, our, our code generator. And it's gonna ask us kind of, what are we doing? Well, at the moment we're building a backend API. Um, where is the path to our schema? And I get exactly where this is. So it is at dot slash GraphQL slash schema. Um, so you can actually do this to a remote schema. So if you're building something that mm. was um, like just a client side application, just like a React application talking to a backend, um, yeah, you can do that. Uh, but I've got a local schema instead. Uh, we're going to generate TypeScript and TypeScript resolvers. And we are going to put this into a file called GraphQL generated TS. And we'll generate an introspection file. We'll call it code gen YAML, add script, we'll call that Gen. Okay, so those last commands that I quickly jumped through. Um, so an introspection file is a thing that can be used by other GraphQL servers to interrogate your GraphQL server. Um, I tend to generate just because it, it can be a useful thing, particularly for um, a demo application such as this, but it's the sort of thing you might not want in a production system. Um, it uses a YAML config file. Um, if you really detest YAML, you can use JSON configs. Um, but just by default, it wants to go YAML, and then it will add a script to your package JSON uh, that will uh, uh, call whatever you want so that you can run the code generator. Um, I've called it gen, so we can just do npm run gen uh, when that is completed. So uh, 
This has added a bunch of dependencies. Um, I just have to run an npm install to make sure that they are all actually installed. And give it a moment. I can do npm run gen. And we will end up with a brand new file generated.ts, which is the same thing that we had with inside of the browser just a moment ago. Uh, we see that we have our, a bunch of custom types for like maybe and uh, exact. We have our game type and our game state as an EDOM player, so on and so forth. But what I've also done is I've told it I want to generate GraphQL resolvers. So I can come to my resolvers.ts where we had our inherently untyped information. And if I was to go resolvers, resolver, or is it resolver, or resolver, resolvers, we go, import that. And now we have a whole bunch of stuff that has been added, type safety. So if I hover over our ID parameter, now we remember that we knew that should have been a string because that's what we had in our schema. It was an any because we didn't understand the type system. But now that I've generated resolvers from our schema, it knows that game has a parameter of ID passed in and it is a string. Magic. That's very cool. Yep. Now, Same with one, my result. Yeah. One real quick Go question. Uh, and and, and I, want, I, I, want, I, I want you to keep going in there, but I, I do have one real quick question um, now that I've interrupted you. Is As you were going through the list of choices, one of the things that I noticed is it did give you support for, uh, for MongoDB. So if I yes. choose that, um, what will that add? Will that also add like the client code to call out to Mongo or does it add like specific types that Mongo might be looking for? So what it'll do is it'll generate, uh, I, so I haven't played around with it a huge amount. So I've only kind of seen that actually, rather than me talking through it, I think I can get it to in here, MongoDB models. So this is what you'll get um, when you do that. So you would end up with like, a, like here's our, um, like our object ID from Mongo, uh, from Mongoose. Or from, mm, from MongoDB. Okay. So we end up with the base models that we would be using to then store. So um, that's the kind of the primitives that you would have. Um, in, if you wanted your GraphQL schema to 100% map through to your, um, your your downstream model, that's the, okay. That's what it would do. Yeah. Okay. That 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 actually makes a lot of sense. That's really cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But obviously, the the risk you're running there is you're you're directly exposing your backend data structure to the client and that may not be something that you want so that's just a i'd say that's a thing to be mindful of right okay um cool so done we're we're getting there um but we still haven't managed to add type safety to our data source like it's it's still an any and that means that well answers is an any so we're ending up with any's when we're trying to do a filter so like I know this works because I wrote the back end code, but how do we make sure that we can get that stuff all done? Well, I'm going to jump through the completed version just because uh, for the essence of time, but mm -hmm. I'll look at all the important pieces as they come together here. Uh, so um, the, the way that I, I can do that is we're using what's called a context in Apollo. So uh, Apollo has the ability to insert things as um, uh, contextual information into a resolver. And we create a context object that represents that. Uh, and I can statically type that. And I've called that Apollo context because I'm highly imaginative. And I'm saying that our Apollo context is going to have data sources. And that, ha that data source has, the data sources has three um, properties on it user, game, and question. And they're, they're interfaces, so that's just a, an abstraction so that I could swap between in-memory and Cosmos DB implementations. Um, when I set up my Apollo server, I give it the, the context here. Uh, sorry, I give it the data sources here that is then added to our context. Um, and then, I, but I need some way to tell the resolvers that, to be aware of this uh, and tell the generated resolvers from um, GraphQL CodeGen to be aware of this. So inside of the CodeGen schema file, I can extend the way the generation works by saying, here is a context type. Here's the file that it is, and then that's the name of the, uh, that's the thing that's being exported for that. Um, similarly, I might want backend data models to be slightly different from my client side data models. 
So, um, uh, for example, um, if we have a look at the data model for our question. So our question has question, category, incorrect answers, correct answer, type and difficulty. But in our schema, a question only has question, correct answer, and answers. There's no way to, there's no indication of the incorrect answer. Um, we just get back a set of answers which contains the correct answer. Um, also, correct answer doesn't have a underscore in it. It's um, it's camel case, not underscore case. I forget which one we what, what that one's called. So we need some way to kind of map those through. So we um, so what I've done is inside of the Snake case, that's what it's file. called. But, but the underscores, yeah, it's snake case. Yeah, Took me a minute to remember that as well. <laughs> Python uses that. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very much not a Python person. I know that you are, uh, so <laughs> I, you're more likely familiar th than I am. Um, so, so again, in the config, I'm, I'm mapping, when you find a question type with inside of my schema, the Resolver is capable of working with this question model, which is my backend, but it's going to ultimately return the schema um, object. So I have to do my own custom mappings there. So how does that work? Well, I've expanded out. Uh, so I've, I've run the GraphQL code gen. Now it's detected that I've got a context type and that's what the context type is. And you'll see that now we have IntelliSense there. Oh, sorry, we, we have type information there. Data sources is strongly typed. It has user, game, question, there are those interfaces. I can see on game is an iGame data source. It has get game, which is get. Uh, so it was actually get game, not get game by ID, which is what I'd originally thought it might have been. So that one would have exploded on me. But I can see that it's there. I can see that it returns, it expects an argument, which is a string, and it can return a promise. I now can await against that because I know that it's an, uh, an async operation. I get back a game model that I can map and so on. I, we're really getting some powerful type safety here. Um, and then I can come down to my question. So a resolver, while we'd initially been looking at resolvers for how we do the like the, the entry point query, so the get game or games and things like that, well, I have to do some mapping between our backend data model and our, um, our schema data model because, well, we have answers, but answers contain, is, a, is an amalgamation of the incorrect answers and the correct answer. So inside of here, I do answers and then I just can cap them into a single array and then randomize them. Or for correct answer, I do a model mapper of correct an underscore answers, so the snake case to the Pascal, uh, to the camel case, so on and so forth. So, but this knows that the question that is received is the backend data model, but it needs to return something for our, um, uh, our, our schema uh, model. So yeah, that's, we're getting a lot of good type safety that is helping us understand the differences between client side, server side, backend data store, schema do, uh, data design. I appreciate that. And so now everything has a type. So as you go in and start to continue to, to add features and add functionality, it's it's now just a matter of, you know, dot whatever, dot whatever, dot whatever. And VS Code is then going to help you out and help guide you that whole way through it. And, and the TypeScript compiler is going to help out as well because if I was to, you know, if I still had up here um, uh, get game by ID, by ID, uh, I could. <laughs> I, you know, to, to a certain extent, that's like perfect that you had the typos in there because you're getting the red squigglies. <laughs> yeah, um, but now I'm getting the red squigglies because get game by ID doesn't exist. And if I was to run um, the TypeScript compiler, so if I was to run TSC against this, it would also give me an error because that doesn't exist. So I, I now get that type safety, whereas I previously didn't have that. Um, look how many times I got it wrong. <laughs> uh, now I know that we're getting close to the end, uh, but I do have one other thing that I want to show, like where the power of type safety can really get. And that's when we start building out our client as well. So this workshop, we end up building a React UI over the top of this. But the React UI needs to talk GraphQL and well, we kind of want it to talk the same schema language that's been um, talked by our server. So that you know, we get the same data models. We, we know that if I added a field to our schema that the client would be aware that that uh, field existed. And if I was to change the casing of something or I was to remove a field, then we'd get all of that. Um, so what I've done is I've actually created a bunch of queries that these are the queries I want you to be able to execute. Uh, and this is 
um, a common pattern in GraphQL, you would, you would create operations, um, as we tend to call them, that uh, you're, you expect the client to be able to call. Um, and these are ones that you've potentially optimized your server for. So I want to uh, create a new game. So a mutation is how we, um, we create data, whereas a query is how we get data. Um, sorry, a mutation is modify state on the server. Um, mm. A query is return state from server. Uh, so this mutation, we're creating a game and we're only going to get the ID back from here. Now, I want to be aware of that operation and I want the type safety of that when I come to the uh, create game uh, react component. So I have added an extension to the GraphQL code generator that allows me to generate React, uh, so, um, uh, generate from these operations things that I can use with inside of React, and then, then I can combine them with the Apollo client, which has React hooks. So I've just got a use mutation, which is a React hook provided by Apollo client. I've then got this create game document, which is something that has been generated by GraphQL code gen, which is um, a it's kind of a, a syntax tree that tells GraphQL, uh, it tells Apollo client how to execute a GraphQL operation, but it's type safe. It knows that it, um, uh, if we execute that, it's going to return me an object which has uh, create game when executed is going to have some data that's available from it, which if we eventually unpack all the way down here, and I'm just doing a bunch of null checking. So we're not loading, we have called it. There wasn't an error and the error and the data did have create game returned. Create game has a property called ID, which is a string, which is what we expect based off of the operation that we'd previously defined. I know that was highly rushed and very um, <laughs> condensed look at how we can add type safety at a, um, at a client level, but in this React application, we are aware of something that is provided by our GraphQL server that has, you know, we, we can see the type safety kind of all the way down to the end of that. Yes, that's... Uh, <laughs> no, that's perfect. That's, I was just that's pasting the, the, the workshop <laughs> link in. Yeah, yep. yeah. No, I, I, I appreciate that. And it really, I, I also think it just, it, you know, really just highlights, uh, you know, again, that great advantage of, of TypeScript is that now you have, you know, you have that type safety, you have the IntelliSense, like you have everything that you really want. So that way you don't have to remember, is it, you know, uh, get game or get game by ID? Um, and you can do that, you know, from the server all the way down to the client and back again. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, no, I I, uh, I I appreciate that. Cool. Um, so where can uh, where can people find you? Where can they find more resources? So uh, I think you, you've pasted into the the chat um, the the lead to the workshop. Um, so that I said that's on my GitHub uh, GitHub.com slash Aaron Powell slash Graph uh, uh, what is it uh, GraphQL TypeScript workshop. That's it. Um, and. It's got instructions on each of the eight steps throughout the workshop. If you want to go um, and do them uh, piece by piece, uh, uh, the, all the code snippets are in there that you would insert along, uh, along the, the steps. Um, uh, uh, they've got dev containers, so you don't need to install anything other than VS Code, um, Docker, and the dev containers extension. That kind of seems like a lot now that I say it. Uh, <laughs> and you, can, you can write it in code spaces as well if you'd prefer. Um, but then it'll set up the rest of it for you. Um, and if you want to learn, uh, so uh, the, the tool that I use to do this code generator is um, GraphQL Code Generator uh, and uh, GraphQL Code Generator.com. Um, but there is, uh, uh, there's the other one that I, I mentioned if you prefer to go down the, um, the, uh, the code first approach. Um, and, and lastly, uh, I've been doing a series of blog posts around how we can use GraphQL on Azure um, that you'll find on my website at um, aaron-pal.com. Um, and I think the, uh, the uh, link that will probably pop up on the, the back yeah. is, uh, down below like, uh, <laughs> the, the, is the link to the, the first um, article in the series where we get started. Uh, and this, it doesn't look at necessarily this workshop in particular, but it looks at all things related to GraphQL on Azure, um, like how you can deploy GraphQL to Azure, how you can talk to databases. Um, at the end of last year, I did one about how to integrate logging um, into a GraphQL server so that you can uh, integrate that with Azure Monitor and uh, and, and get uh, logging insights there as well. 
Beautiful. That is perfect. Aaron, thank you so much for, for coming on, chatting a lot about uh, GraphQL and TypeScript. I know I learned something, and we're going to have to figure out how to get you back on again uh, sometime, hopefully soon. I'm sure we'll find a reason. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, that is uh, Web Wednesday. We're back next week to take a look at uh, some cool 3D stuff uh, that you can do in uh, JavaScript. So I definitely hope you'll uh, join. But uh, in the meantime, thank you very much for, uh, for tuning in. Bye.